Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of How I Teach with the Language Arts Lady. This is episode number 10, and it is How I Teach the Dialogue Story for 6th through 12th grade students. I am Donna Reesh, Language Arts Lady, your host and your teacher and curriculum author. I'm really excited to talk to you about dialogue teaching specifically today because I love, love, love teaching dialogue. And one of the reasons why I love teaching dialogue is because it opens up a world of possibility for students. When students who are very creative, who want to write, who yearn to write, who love to write, who are especially um, extra uh, creative, and really want to write with characters and want to write story. Um, forgot to set my timer again. They really want to know how to write dialogue. And you know, they have their fumblings and their very beginnings and they're trying so hard. And so I love, love, love giving them these tools. I love to just open up these new doors for writers, uh, for those creative writers. So before we begin, I'm going to do a little housekeeping like I often do just to give you the lay of the land. So there are two ways to consume how I teach. You can join on the podcast episode and th that is at your uh, favorite po podcast provider and that would be an audio course. And with that, then you can follow along. And if you happen to be watching the video, I have my screen right now showing this week's teacher's notebook pages. So you can listen with or without them. Some of the episodes uh, are really, really visually um, heavy, like last week's um, How I Teach Student Editing and, Re Editing and Revising with the Checklist Challenge. Really difficult to see, to see that in your brain without seeing all of the coding and the color, coloring and the coding from the chart, the Checklist Challenge chart to the student paper. And others are less so, um, you know, visually dependent. Um, this one will fall somewhere in the middle because definitely teaching dialogue involves a lot of punctuation. And so uh, this will be a lot of that. So uh, that's one way is to listen to the audio. The other way is to watch the video. And when you watch the video, you will be watching a PowerPoint presentation. So that is really nice because you'll have the visual right in front of you. Either way, hop on over to Language Arts Lady blog, and let me see where it says all about that. Yes, here it is. Hop on over to languageartsladyblog.com forward slash how I teach. This is in your back matter if you are um, listening to the audio and ruffling through your teacher's notebook. Um, but if you don't have a teacher's notebook, it's languageartsladyblog.com forward slash how I teach. All of the episode sheets for all of the episodes are there, or you could just go ahead and go to languageartsladyblog.com forward slash teacher's notebook and get all episodes, all of the teacher's notebooks. So you want the teacher's notebooks for a number of reasons. First of all, I am teaching from it. So it's good to watch the PowerPoint for sure. The PowerPoint is exactly what is contained in the teacher's notebook. So exactly what you see here on my screen in the teacher's notebook is also what you will find in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so that is nice to have this printable of that. So all the lesson, all the dialogue teaching that I'm doing here, right here, look at that amazing mentor text, student sample that you're going to be able to learn um, dialogue from and how to teach it. It will be in your teacher's notebook. Additionally, though, you have, look here, the lesson and the outlining space and the student sample and the dialogue lesson and the speech tag lesson and the speech tag words. <laughs> this is jam packed with freebies for you to use with your students. So you want your teacher's notebook. Okay. So without further ado, I am going to hop on over to the PowerPoint and begin. Here we go. View. Um, no, not view. Um, slideshow. Excuse me. All right, here we go. 
how I teach with language arts lady. Uh, the dialogue story for sixth through 12th graders. Now this is a really broad range. And um, this is because you, dialogue is actually quite easy to make multi-level. So with dialogue and multi-level, a lot of times I will have what I call basic students and extension students. And you'll see that in all of my books, whether they are, um, you know, one semester meaningful composition books or one month downloadable products or one or two week downloadable products. And you will see that uh, there's, ba there's basic and there's extension. But even within that, like it's not uncommon at all for me to have a, stu a table of eight or nine or 10, literally junior high boys. That's what I was facing today. And uh, so they are between sixth and ninth grade. And I am literally doing something like for their dialogue story. Okay, basic students, you, 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 and you. And they know they're basic because they're either younger or they haven't written as much or they haven't done my programs as much. And so they, you, 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 and you, you're gonna do basic dialogue. So you have to have six sentences of dialogue. And you're gonna see this in just a minute in the overview box. So you four are basic, you have six sentences of dialogue. Okay, you extension, you two extension kids, boys. <laughs> yes, you, I love teaching boys. I have um, four boys myself and you two are going to do extension. So you have to have 10 sentences of dialogue in your paper and look over here, you further extension kids, you upper kids, you kids who are about ready to go out of this book. You two have to have 12 sentences of dialogue with um, a colon following your speech tag at least one time. Whoa, right? Dialogue is so multi-level. It depends on how much experience they have had with writing quotations and writing dialogue. So it is multi-level. It can be very multi-level. And this assignment uh, that I'm going to teach you from um, Peter Pan, uh, book three, level three. Um, it is a dialogue between toys in, no, among, I, I can't remember how many kids are speaking. We're going to see this. It is a dialogue among toys in Peter, in um, Wendy, Michael, and John's playroom. So how cool is that? All right. And, um, so it's just so much fun. It's so much fun. Okay. All right. So just a moment ago, I talked about how I, you can multi-level it. So this slide, if you're watching it, says the overview of original dialogue essay. If you're following along in your teacher's notebook, it is a, um, depending on whether you print it in color or not, it is a blue box. And again, and it's two slides here. Again, this is how I tell my students the expectations. You don't have to have an overview, an expectation set up that is this extensive. I like to have this extensive of an expectation explanation for my students because they've come to rely on it. They've come to need it. They've come to uh, know that they can, we put a sticky on the top, it says overview, and they know that they can come back here and they can say, okay, I have to do 10 paragraphs because I'm basic. I have to do 32 to 40 total sentences because of dialogue. We're not, they're going to count sentences rather than paragraphs. Um, wrong way. I have to do an opening. I'm not doing a closing. I have to have dialogue. Uh, with through via direct quotations, boom. Okay, so they just go through here and they highlight everything that applies to them. They keep that little overview sticker on the top, so it doesn't have to be this elaborate. But this is amazing. If your students come to rely on some, this is the beginning of the project, and this is what the whole project entails. These are not their assignments. This is the big picture of the entire project. All right, so let's just hang out here with the Roman numeral two and the Roman numeral three in the overview box. All right, we have paragraphs and normally my assignments are based on paragraphs. Okay, I don't base my writing assignments on word count because papers 
essays, research projects, research papers, stories, journal pieces, memoirs, uh, whatever the student is writing is not made up of words. Okay. All right. It is made up of words, but it, that's not what, what do you get when you say you have to have a hundred words? You get a student counting the words and then sticking in some words here and there to get up to 100. They're at 96. They're just going to put a few in here and there. I prefer to tell my students that words make up sentences. Sentences make up paragraphs and paragraphs make up anything else you want to write. <laughs> paragraphs make up your research papers, essays, stories, literary analysis pieces, journal art, journalistic pieces, journals, memoirs, personal essays, personal, I mean, they, paragraphs are what make everything up. So I seldom count anything. Um, I, I tell them how many, you know, a, a range of sentences that they have to have in each paragraph. Um, but generally speaking, I am hanging out in the paragraph area a lot. I am telling my kids, you know, this is a 10 paragraph paper, this is an eight paragraph paper, whatever it might be. However, when it comes to dialogue, because one of the first rules of dialogue is that you alternate paragraphs every time a different speaker speaks. And so because of that, they could have a, 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 a paragraph that says, hi, the next paragraph, howdy, the next paragraph, what you up to, the next paragraph, not much, four paragraphs and four sentences which are even sketch for sentences, right? So because of that, we go to this Roman numeral three and we use this a lot with dialogue and that is paragraphs versus sentences. So uh, instead of counting paragraphs, you will count sentences. And then they just mark, I'm basic, I'm doing 32 to 40 sentences. I'm extensions, I'm doing 40 to, six, 40 to 46. And they can always do more. They just can't do fewer. That is my uh, mantra. Uh, because I usually have somebody in every class ask if they can do more. Sweet, sweet angels. Okay. So uh, then we have the write-on skills. They are going to learn dialogue. Here we go. All right. So this assignment is laid out um, to where they read the sample first. And I'm at lesson A at the top. They read the sample first, and then they jot down notes in the brainstorming box about what you think you could include your essay, what caused your two toys to come alive in your story, character, personality notes about your main characters, describers, and so forth. Okay, the beauty of a lot of these write on, um, write for a month lessons and, and all of my week long uh, lessons that are coming up at Teachers Pay Teachers and all of my 40 month long books that are downloadable is that um, they are things that students know something about. Most people know something a little bit about Peter Pan, you know, through movies, even though it was originally a book, right? So a lot of these are based off of the book, but kids know about the movies. All right. So then they're going to follow these instructions to prepare to out there, outline their dialogue. Um, they're going to be sure that each paragraph contains at least one sentence. They're going to have at least two Toys speaking, and these should be two toys found in the Darling Nursery. Oh, I forgot. I gave them a list of ideas, too, of what might be in a Victorian England home. And back to the overview box again. So you might have a, a hoop, a toy wagon, a kite, a spinning wheel, a puppet, a board game, a jigsaw puzzle, cards, ball. So they're going to have dialogue between. Now I have other dialogue papers. I have two between inventors, and I have one between inventors for high schoolers and one between um, authors for high schoolers. Oh, the samples are fantastic. Zach, my writing assistant wrote those. They're just the, the mentor text, the samples that uh, all of my lessons contain are just out of this world. You just can't find anything like it any place else. And I'm not just saying that just because I wrote these books and I'm bragging on them, but the time that it takes to generate all of the mentor text and all the sample essays and sample reports and things like that for students to learn from is usually not something that a lot of um, curriculum companies and authors have either don't take the time or um, maybe just don't have that aspect in their book. But here is our sample that the student is going to read. 
before they outline there. So there, there's the outlining space, it's a thing of beauty. Here is the student sample. So this is called The Rocking Horse and the Toy Soldier. And this was actually written from by one of my students. Uh, uh, Zach, I think, started writing for me about five years ago. And prior to his writing for me, we had student samples all the time. Um, and, and they are fantastic. The student samples are fantastic too. But the nice thing about having a mentor text or a sample done by an adult is that I can tell him I want this extensive, like the difficulty of the sentences, the difficulty of the content, the uh, length of the paragraphs, all of those things that make a sample be right at uh, a certain readability and writability level. So that's a, that's a thing of beauty there with Zach. Okay, but this is amazing by Brady. And uh, we, the student will actually learn dialogue from the sample. So you can see that the paragraphs are bold fonted in parentheses, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, and so forth. And you can see that it is, um, he has a really great opener. Uh, there are many different types of toys in Victorian England. Two of the main toys they had were toy soldiers and the rocking horse. In the 1800s, a boy would use his imaginations to have, that imagination to have battles with his toy soldiers. There were no cars in Victorian times, so horses were the main source of transportation. This made the rocking horse extremely popular. Very great opening paragraph. Wealthier Victorian children could afford a rocking horse, but poorer children could only afford a hobby horse, a stick with a horse's head on it. And that is his opening. And then he goes into the body. One night in Victorian England, a small nursery was coming alive. Who does not love stories about, child, about toys coming to life? It's, it's literally my favorite. I mean, Toy Story, one, two, three, <laughs> right? How about Corduroy? How about Paddington? How about the most wonderful toys? Oh my word, they are the most gorgeous, lovable, heart um, pulling stories, aren't they? And uh, so kids really like writing these. This is really a lot of fun. And uh, coming live to the toy sergeant, the toy soldier and Bucky the rocking horse were especially happy to be alive. It had been a long time since Bucky and Sergeant had seen each other. And then they start dialoguing. And the, the length of their dialogue would be based on their level, right? And every time a new speaker begins speaking, they change paragraphs. So hello, Sergeant, it's good to see you, shouted Bucky happily. Paragraph four, hello, Bucky, it's good to see you too, exclaimed Sergeant, look at that perfect dialogue. They were both happy that they got the chance to see each other again. Bucky asked, remember the time when Wendy was rocking back and forth so fast that she flew right off of me? She rocked so fast that even I fell over. And then they just talk back and forth. Oh, my word, it's a thing of beauty. All right, so they are going to actually learn how to put their dialogue in here. So um, it says right here that if they've never had one of my writing dialogue lessons before, they should go back and do the dialogue lesson and then outline. All right, so let's go over to the dialogue lesson. The dialogue lesson has a student going back into the mentor text, into the sample, and finding the speakers in each paragraph. That is the beginning of dialogue writing, is realizing who the speakers are and knowing how to tag those. We call those speech tags in my books. Some books call them speaker. I don't even know what they call them. <laughs> I've always called them the speech tags. They tag the speaker. I always like to use whatever terminology when there's when there are choices to call something, you know, like subordinate clauses, subordinators versus um, conjunctives, uh, like conjunct coordinating conjunctions or coordinating conjunctions. But some books and handbooks call subordinators subordinators, and call some call them um, other conjunctives or something. And I always use the term that has the meaning in the term. So subordinator means it's subordinate to the rest of the sentence. And speech tag means it tags the speaker. So I always use when there, when there, is, a, when there is a choice for terminology, I always use the terminology that has the meaning of it in it, like noun markers versus articles. I put articles in parentheses, parentheses but I call them noun markers because they mark nouns. So, you know me, I love the children and I want things to be as easy as possible for them. All right, so they're gonna go in and they are going to um, 
highlight each speaker. So in paragraph three, they're going to highlight shouted Bucky happily. Paragraph four, they're going to highlight exclaimed Sergeant. In paragraph five, they're going to highlight Bucky ask. In paragraph six, they're going to highlight Sergeant ask. And this is all listed. If you don't have your page in front of you, it's listed. Um, what paragraphs and what the student should highlight. Notice how it jumps down in paragraph in number seven and says in paragraph nine, the speaker is not given, but you know that the speaker is Bucky because a new paragraph has started and the previous speaker was Sergeant. So there we are having our big rule of every time a new speaker speaks, a new paragraph is begun. And at this point, I remind them, remember how you read books before and like you had a whole page with just dialogue, 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 dialogue and it kept changing paragraphs, but it didn't tell you who was speaking for a long time. And you had to go back up and count and count and count and, and see when the last speaker was and then go back over and count to your other one. You don't wanna do that. Do you remember how frustrated you were when you read that book? And they're like, yes, right. And that is what we don't do. We put enough speech tags in to mark the speaker for the reader, but not so many that it's difficult to read, okay? All right, so this is the beginning of the dialogue lesson. And of course, the first step is each time the speaker changes, a new paragraph is started. And then it has the two uh, first rules of speech tag and uh, quote writing. Number two, when a speech tag comes at the beginning, you put a comma, quote, capital letter. And then there, there's a sample there. I always have samples in all of the lessons. So Bucky agreed, comma, quote, capital Y. Yes, it is all very strange, period, quote. Okay, when a speech tag comes at the end of the sentence, if your quote is a statement, put a comma and then a quotation mark. So poor Michael lost most of the battles, comma, quote, lowercase added sergeant. If your quote is a question or an exclamation sentence, put that mark. All right, and usually at this point, we do a lot of highlighting. So they'll have a few colors of highlighters out there in front of them. And I am com coming down here to the next part where it says you cannot have two periods in the same sentence as being used as a period. And then I have my samples there again. Poor Michael lost most of the battles, comma, quote, added sergeant. What I will do there is I'll have them highlight, comma, quote, draw an arrow to the margin, highlight the period after sergeant, draw an arrow to the margin, and then I have them write one period per sentence in their margin, okay? I do a lot of interactive where they are highlighting the exclamation mark, highlighting the quote mark, highlighting the period, highlighting the commas, and then making margin notes as well. Um, and this is because then they are doing. They're not just reading. They're not just staring out the window. They are being interactive with the teaching text. All right, and then it tells them that if it's an exclamation point or a question mark, you can have that and a period. And then there are some samples there as well. So I really like to take this teaching slowly, do a lot of highlighting, maybe even everybody write a sample down on a piece of paper and hold it up, you know, just give them a chance to really soak it in. And then we always go back to the mentor text, back to the sample, and that also helps them. All right, then we talk about speech tag words and how you want to learn some other ways to say said, asked, or exclaimed, because when you're writing has a lot of dialogue, it can become laborious for a reader to keep reading said, 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 or asked, asked, asked. And so we have them, I have them looking up uh, synonyms for say or said, um, and then and then look up synonyms for the words that they just listed, right? This is a really good exercise to look up something and then look up that again, right? Because they're going to even expand their vocabulary a lot more. Then they're going to do the same thing with ask. They're going to do the same thing with exclaim or exclaimed. And um, I'm not going to get into this lesson. This is a really advanced lesson. It is only for um, students who have dialogue writing really down pat. And when they do, then we move into when you would use a cult one following a speech tag. And there's a lesson there. You can use it if you want. Um, it's a good lesson. Uh, my son wrote it. <laughs> but um, uh, I do not go 
guys, incremental and slow. Those are going to be two key words for teaching dialogue, right? So we're just going to hang out here. I even just tell my, tell my students, you know what? You can just use beginning speech tags for this project if that is all you're ready for. You know, uh, uh, Wendy's doll said, comma, quote, okay? All right. Uh, then they write their rough draft. They do have these boxes. Um, and these are not up at Language Arts Lady or Teachers Pay Teachers yet, but they will be. Uh, they, they will probably be free or they might be a dollar or something. Um, but these are words that you can use in place of said, like what, how many are there? Like hundred, like a hundred probably. And then words that can be used in place of asked and words that can be used in place of exclaim. Those are valuable boxes there to have for your student. Okay, I want to go back and look at this uh, sample again. We hang out in the sample a whole lot with our highlighter colors, all right? So we are looking at them. I'm asking questions like, in paragraph nine, why is there no speech tag? After we've already read it, we've already talked about everything, then we are just, quote unquote, dialoguing about it. All right, then I'm coming along and I'm saying, okay, in paragraph 12, why does dust have a comma after it instead of a period? Because I want them to verbalize because a sentence can't have two periods used as periods, right? You can have, you know, obviously Mr. and Mrs. and Dr. and stuff like that, but it cannot have two periods used as a period. So when you have a closing speech tag, you have a comma quote. Okay, then we go through and we also highlight a bunch of quotation marks and notice how in the United States, the punctuation is inside in dialogue. So it's good to see you exclamation mark quote. It's good to see you too, exclamation mark quote. And I do a lot of that. And the reason I do a lot of that, and, and that's also taught here in the lesson that you have your, um, your end mark, then your quotation mark, then your lowercase shouted, Becky, Bucky. Um, and so that's all taught there too. Commas and periods always go inside quotation marks. Again, slow for these lessons, not anything like I'm doing them for you here. Um, but I do that so that they have the chance to see how all of those punctuation marks, because it's dialogue, whether they are periods, commas, exclamation points, or question marks, they are inside the closing quotation mark, not outside of it. And then I say, how many of you read um, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien? How many read um, any other English writers? And they tell me who they're reading and, you know, how much they like their books and stuff like that. And then I say, have you ever noticed that in English writers, sometimes the, uh, in dialogue, the punctuation will be on the outside of the quotation mark? And they're like, yeah, that's how I thought you did it. And then I point out to them that in the US, in dialogue, they go inside, okay? It's also just um, when I do some quote work for research reports that I will be doing in upcoming uh, episodes, uh, the commas and periods are always inside quotation marks in the US, no matter where they fall. But that's not the way it is in other places. Right, so you might have a traveling exhibit at a museum like I did, and I tell my students this all the time. And I wanted to go through and fix every one of their placards because they all had um, quote period because it was not a U.S. exhibit; it was a traveling exhibit from Scandinavia or somewhere. So we just go through here slowly and carefully. Then I tell them, you know what? When you write your dialogue essay. You can text me, you can call me, you can FaceTime me, you can show up on my porch and I will help you with your punctuation. Or you can bring it to class and I'll help you or you can turn it in and my grader or I or both of us will fix it for you and show it to you and show you why it wasn't, why it, why it needed to be this way or that way, right? Those edits that you put on your students' papers are some of the best learning tools that we can provide for our students. So do not uh, shrink back from giving thorough edits and thorough feedback on their students' writings because that is how they're going to learn. We consider it to be just one step in the teaching process. Then when they put those edits in for their final, 
project, they are reminded again, oh yeah, my period needed to go inside. Oh yeah, my comma needed to go inside my quotation mark, right? Because we have marked it for them, all right? And um, if you happen to live locally and you come to my classes, I will do that for your student. If you um, use one of our programs online, I will do that for your student as well. All right, so then the student is going to come back and be ready to outline. So I have my students put their quotation marks on the lines and put a few key words that they want to put in their outline. All right, and that way they know that that one, they wanted that to be a quote. I remind them that they are going to change paragraphs every time the speaker changes. So they might have one or two or three sentences in a paragraph and then one sentence and then two sentences. Right, so I remind them of that. I also tell them it's super important to put the topic a paragraph. So Bucky speaking, and then you know the other one answering, so forth, that they have the topic of paragraphs all throughout their outline. And if they don't have enough space or they want to divide it up or make, you know, make lines through it and make themselves more paragraphs, they can do that as well. Or they can photocopy or they can do it on paper. So this is how I teach dialogue writing. And again, this is uh, sixth through 12th grade. And let me see, I'm thinking that Grady may have been in seventh or eighth, maybe seventh grade when he did this. Um, so you can see that seventh and eighth graders, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, they can write with dialogue if they have instruction. Now, it's also important to note that this wasn't the first time they've ever had quotation marks. We don't go from no quotes to, oh, guess what? You're gonna have 12 paragraphs of dialogue and you're gonna have quotes in every one of them and you're going to punctuate it correctly. We don't go from that to that, right? Incrementality, one of my favorite words ever. One of my favorite words for life changes and one of my favorite words for teaching that we wanna do this slowly. So they've already had quotation marks. They've had passages where they copied and they put quotation marks. They, they've copied over quotation marks with the proper punctuation. They've had essays where they just had to put one quote in an opening paragraph and talk about that quote. They've done all kinds of things leading up to this by sixth or seventh grade with quotations and quotation marks. So dialogue is just the next natural step. All right, without further ado, let me take you back to the back matter. Again, get your How I Teach Teacher's Notebook Sheets right? Because they have all these free lessons for you and just so many freebies. You want to have these in your notebook for yourself and able to print them off to use with your students. These are free products that are related to this episode. These are dialogue. The ones that I described today are dialogue essays only, but every time kids write stories, um, if they are above, you know, sixth grade or above, they have some level of dialogue in them. So these will all have some dialogue, different places. They might have to put a quote someplace. They might have to put dialogue between characters. And those are all free. Uh, Beauty and the Beast 1, Mowgli 2, Peter Pan 3, Mowgli 4, and Peter Pan 5. Those are free that you can get when you subscribe to Language Arts Lady blog. All right, and then we also have just the this lesson here and some in meaningful composition, but we have these in uh, Slinky Dog 4 and Peter Pan 3 specific um, dialogue lessons. And then we have uh, our creative writing books for meaningful composition. These are one semester long, and they have the two inventors dialogue and the two authors dialogue. That's Meaningful Composition 7-2 and Meaningful Composition 9-2. Many of these will be available as one and two week writing projects at Teachers Pay Teachers and Language Arts Lady uh, blog and store very soon, um, by, probably by the end of the summer. This is uh, April 2021. So we're putting our um, one and two week projects up as standalone products for Teachers Pay Teachers, homeschoolers, tutors, co-ops, and so forth. All right, and also in the back matter, you can create a class. It can be in online or it can be in person. I can teach four or five, six, eight kids, whatever you want me to teach them from any of my books. I have 120 books, so you have a lot to choose from. Uh, you can also hire a teacher 
from but, uh, my husband and I are both um, out for hire to just teach a subject or two subjects to your students. Um, most high school classes are available through my husband. Uh, we are both trained in reading. He has just recently done the dyslexia Orton Gillingham training for phonics and beginning reading, remedial reading. Um, I do tons of writing classes, writing private students, grammar, spelling, all kinds of things. And he does tons of uh, social science and science and so forth for high school. So we can set that up. And we also have private tutoring uh, online or in person. So thank you so much for joining me today for How I Teach, episode number 10, How I Teach the Dialogue Story for 6th through 12th graders. I will see you again next time on How I Teach.